All right, I'm going to introduce a man who needs no introduction. He has forgotten more about wireless than I have ever learned because he has been doing wireless for exactly one year longer than I've been alive, I believe. So please sit down and learn everything that you wished you understood about wireless but never had the time to learn. He has been a long time learning it, and he's going to distill it into two short hours for you. Grab yourself some water, sit down. I hope you went to the bathroom before this. You're not going to want to miss a second. Eric. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, guys. Yeah! So yeah, my name is Eric Johnson. Um, I'm currently an employee of Hewlett Packard Aruba. Um, been a wireless guy for 31 years. Designed antennas for eight years. Worked for Nortel as a base station architect on cellular. And I've been doing Wi-Fi now for the last 16 years. So um, if at any point during this presentation you feel nauseous, please lay down on the floor, breathe calmly, and plug your ears. All right, so. Let's talk a little bit about what, where, we've, where, we're, where we're at today with Wi-Fi. Um, coming up through, you know, the, the standard developed as a best effort sort of data solution. Um, it's been evolving, uh, you know, through 11N. 11N was a pretty radical change when we introduced the concept of MIMO, the idea of transmitting more than one stream of data at the same time. Then with 11AC, we extended a lot of those concepts. but. Really, you know, it was really about, it was very consumer driven. It was about getting the biggest number possible on the side of the box when they put it into Best Buy or what your local electronics store. Um, so it, it really kind of ignored some of the actual issues that you run into when you're actually doing high density communications. Um, one of them is, is it, it's kind of an interesting point, is the first picture you see here on the right hand side, this was actually accumulated in our headquarters building in Santa Clara. Um, it turns out that most of the traffic that's being sent over the air actually is not very large, right? It typically tends to be small packets. And if you've got an 80 megahertz wide channel and you're sending a 256 byte packet over the air, that's like sticking a tricycle onto the middle of an 11 lane, 11 lane superhighway, right? It's not a terribly efficient utilization of the spectrum. So this is one of the things that 11AX is a, def definitely looking at addressing. It's one of the key features of 11AX is the idea that, okay, well, maybe we can't do anything about the size of the tricycle, but maybe we can put a whole bunch more tricycles on the road at the same time, right? So this is the idea of OFDMA, and we'll, we'll definitely be touching on that as we go through the presentation. The second thing is, is that CSMA, so Carrier Sense Multiple Access, it's been with us for a long time. It's been working pretty well. But the reality is, is that it means that the radios are actually operating in a pretty conservative fashion. Imagine you're in a, in, a, in a large major sports stadium. It turns out that the amount of power coming off your handset on one side of the stadium is enough to stop a radio on the other side of the stadium operating on the same channel. But that's kind of ridiculous because the access points in stadiums many times are actually under the seats and you're probably maybe 10 feet away from it. So why is your handset not transmitting? You're talking to something that's right there, but you're being interfered with by something that's across the stadium. So this is one of the other things that's being looked at. It allows the system to operate more on an interference basis. And this is something called overlapping BSSs or BSS coloring. And again, we'll touch on that as we go through this. There's a number of other things that, that the standard addresses as well. And we'll, we'll, um, we'll go through that as we go through the presentation. So I'm going to, the, the first chunk of the presentation is going to be focusing on uh, 802.11ax, um, how we get the new data rates, how OFDMA works. And the second part of the presentation is going to be talking about the antenna techniques um, that have been with us since 11N with the introduction of MIMO, then transmit beamforming and multi-user MIMO um, to help you understand how those things work. Because they're very important parts of the standard. They've been with us for a little while, but the way that they operate is not well understood generally. So just a little bit on the, the standards process. Um, just so everyone understands, the, the, the process of writing a standard is actually a really long process. The, the, defi the definition for 11AX was actually written down initially in 2014. So here we are in 2019 and we're just about to have the standard finally ratified. It's a five to six year cycle, right? So it goes through multiple draftings now. IEEE meetings for Wi-Fi, of course, now incorporate hundreds of, hundreds of participants. The original 802.11b standard was written by a couple of dozen people in a, in a dark room. But 11AX now and 802.11, of course, is big business, so that, that attracts a lot more people. Um, so some of the things that they wanted to focus on was improving the efficiency, as we just talked about. 
Also, getting back to 2.4 gig and actually uh, getting around to improving 2.4 so it's not stuck in 11N forever. Um, always with, ha with handsets in particular, the killer feature for everybody's phone is how long the phone operates. So anything you can do to increase the battery life and reduce the power consumption of your radio is always a be beneficial thing and it's, it's in every single standard they work to and continue to improve the power. Wi-Fi, unlike our cellular friends, uh, Wi-Fi is always focused on being backwards compatible as well. Um, the new 5G stuff that you guys are hearing about on the cellular side, that is not backwards compatible with, with 4G. Um, it's, it's one of the benefits that the, that the cellular industry has and in that they don't have to worry about supporting really old phones. But of course the downside is, is you need to upgrade your gear in order to use the radio. Wi-Fi continues to be backwards compatible. In fact, the only thing that was deprecated with 11AX was the infrared mode that was originally defined for 802.11. All right, so the first draft came out in 2016. We're on the third draft now. The products that you're seeing in the marketplace are based on the third draft. Anything that's left at that point, the, the standards body has done a pretty good job of defining all the hardware bits first, and then anything else after that is firmware and can be updated through a software upgrade. All right, so the, the, we're expecting the standard to be ratified early next year. Wi-Fi Alliance certification will probably start in October of this year. Oh yes, a little note. Uh, by the way, the next one, EHT, which is 802.11.be, or sorry, 802.11.be is in now the standardization process. So I don't know, what, you know, it's extreme high throughput is the definition right now. I don't know what comes next, maybe insanely high throughput. All right, so Wi-Fi Alliance, how do they fit in? Well, they're the, the marketing and, and um, certification body. They don't participate, they're, they're a participant in the IEEE process, but they're not, they're, they don't, they're not in control of that process. They're the reason that we have Wi-Fi 6, right? The, that term Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 5 being 11AC, Wi-Fi 4 being 11N, and so on back through the times. And this is to help consumers understand the, the technology. Six is better than five. BE is not necessarily better than AX, which is one of the reasons that they're, they're moving away from sort of the, the, the nerd speak in order to allow the market to understand what's going on in the standards activity. All right, Wi-Fi certification is voluntary, but it's a, it's, it's a general thing that we, that, well, we certainly ascribe to and most handset vendors do as well because it gives you at least a basic level of interoperability. So the standards process, again, will be kicked off. And just as a, as a note, it's not part of my presentation today, but the Wi-Fi 6 certification also requires WPA3 operation as well. So that will move Wi-Fi into a fully encrypted mode. Uh, I know there's other discussions on WPA3 this week, but um, just, just suffice it to say that a device that is Wi-Fi 6 certified is also WPA3 capable. All right, so we're seeing products. You guys have seen the Samsung S10. We're hoping that uh, Apple, will ha their next generation phone, will, will support 11, 11AX. Um, we're fully expecting it to. And then once the certification program's kicked off, we, we figure 11AX is going to be the prevalent standard next year. And that's a little screenshot. The Wi-Fi 6 logo is shown there. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's part of, the, part of the, what makes the consumer feel good about the, uh, the standard. All right, so let's go back to 11N a little bit. Um, we're gonna back up before we go forward. So first of all, just introducing the idea of orthogonal frequency division multiplex. Of course, this, this was actually introduced with 11A and 11G. Uh, OFDM is the idea. In fact, our friends have taken advantage of it here to create some artwork for us. Um, but the idea with OFDM is instead of sending one monolithic channel, you now divide your data up across a whole bunch of individual tones. As you can see in the picture here, right, you've got 26 on the left and 26 on the right, and then there's other, some other ones that are shut off. So I'm gonna just, this is probably the wordiest chart in the deck, but I'm just gonna review this so people are idea of the basic concepts of digital communication. The propagation channel is the most important concept when you're talking about wireless communications. The propagation channel is not the radio channel you're operating on, it's everything that happens in this space. It's all of these columns, the walls, the ceilings, all of you, the chairs, everything that's in this room determines how the bits are transmitted from me to you. 
right? And so the propagation channel is the key element. And understanding the propagation channel is how you actually accomplish digital communications. The radio channel is the channel width. That's a 20, 40, 80, 160 megahertz wide channel. And that's the, the frequency allocation that we put the data over. And then we talk about tones and subcarriers. So in this little picture in the upper right hand corner here, this is a showing uh, 802.11 g, um, which had 52, 52 subcarriers. You can see the red dots on either side. Those are the guard band. Okay, those are tones that are turned off. There's one turned off in the middle because that's where DC is when you down convert this to baseband. Um, so those don't actually have information on them. So we're left with, with, with some tones and then some of those are allocated to be uh, what are called uh, pilot tones. The pilot tones um, don't have any customer or don't have any user information on it. It's known information to help the receiver understand what's happening in the channel. Then a couple of other things, uh, cyclic extension. This is a, an important concept. Um, so in this room, there are multiple multiple paths where I can bounce signal off the walls. It, you know, if I'm in a larger space, it could bounce off the far wall. So we have to do something about those long distance bounces. That's called multipath. Uh, in order to deal with that multipath, we actually, what, the way you do that with OFDM is you extend the symbol. So the, the, when you're sending the data, you, you tack on a chunk of the symbol and you repeat it. Now that's, it's not useful airtime, but it makes the system robust against multipath. And then finally, forward error correction. Like a CRC in an in a Ethernet packet, forward error correction can detect errors. And by also coding data at the transmitter, you can also, you can also decode the errors and fix them. So this is why we call it forward error correction because it's put at the forward end of the link so that the receiver has an opportunity to, to correct an error. All right, by the way, if you guys have questions, stick your hands up because um, I, I know this stuff so I'm happy to go, through that, to go through the questions on the fly. All right, so this is kind of looking at 11 and 11 AC. In the upper left, that was 11 AG. And then we had a, then with uh, 11N, they turned on a couple of the tones. They figured out they didn't need quite as much guard band. So they, they actually recovered four tones, which is about a 10% improvement in throughput. So we have a, uh, a 20 megahertz channel, a 40 megahertz channel, and a 80 megahertz channel is shown here. When you're talking about OFDMA, it starts off with something called an inverse fast Fourier transform. So when you're doing digital Fourier transforms, it's always handy to make things a factor of two. So it turns out that a 20 megahertz channel is based on 64 tones, an 80, a 40 megahertz channel is based on 128 tones, and an 80 megahertz channel is based on 256 tones. It makes the, the, the silicon processing of the Fourier transform very quick. You don't need to know that. It's just a, a, a detail that I thought I'd share with you. Okay, so, so basically you'll note that when you go from the 20 megahertz channel up to the 80 megahertz channel, you actually go from 56 to 242 subcarriers, which is more than a factor of four. And the reason is, is as we aggregate the channels and make them bigger, we recover some of the guard tones on each end of the, each end of the channel. Okay. So most of you have probably got the number of 3.2 microseconds in your head if you're dealing with Wi-Fi. That comes from the symbol duration. One of those individual tones uh, is modulated at 312.5 kilo, uh, kilosymbols per second. Uh, for those of you that are old enough to remember uh, dial-up modems, we talk about this as being the baud rate. That's the, that's the rate at which you send symbols over the air. Um, and then we tack on the guard interval, um, and then we can modulate the signal. So 11N supported up to 64 qualm, 11AC supported up to 256 qualm, and I will show you pictures what I mean by that. Um, and then with 11AX now, we're going up to 1024 qualm. It sounds really impressive. 64 to 256 sounds like four times as fast. It's not actually, it's only about 33% faster and I'll show you why. All right, so that was 11N, 11AC to, to help we understand where we came from. For those of you that have, had, that have equipment that, that you've been using to, to, to listen or to observe 11N and 11AC gear, 11AX has um, actually modified the symbol rate. We went from 312.5 to 78 kilosymbols per second. And there's a real good reason for that, which I will cover, but one of the things it means is that if you've got 11 AC equipment and it's trying to receive 11 AX, 11 AX bursts are complete gibberish to a, to a previous, generate, previous generation radio. 
The backwards compatibility, the radio actually has to adapt down to the previous standard in order for the client to understand it. So, the, so by going to that smaller symbol rate, it takes four times as long to transmit the symbol now. Instead of being 3.2 microseconds, it's now 12.8 microseconds. So it takes four times as long to transmit the data. The big, the big concept with, uh, with 11AX was introduced was OFDMA. And so this introduces the concept of what's called a resource unit. Up to this point, we've been thinking about Wi-Fi as being a 20 megahertz channel, a 40 megahertz channel, an 80 megahertz channel. With 11AX, a resource unit now is a portion of that. The smallest chunk that they carve up in 11AX is, called, is two megahertz wide. That's called a re, RU26, and I'll show, you, I'll show you a picture of that. And then you can have a four megahertz, an eight megahertz, a, a 20 megahertz, and a 40 megahertz block as well. We can, we can now do multiple parallel transmissions. In an 80 megahertz channel, you can have 37 2 megahertz blocks. Each one of those can be servicing a separate user. That means you now have massive parallelism and it has major impacts on the latency and jitter characteristics of Wi-Fi. Okay, because you no longer have to, if, you, if you've got 37 people with small packets, they all had to line up and transmit sequentially with the old standards. With 11AX, I can now transmit to all 37 users at the same time. All right, so that has pretty profound impacts on the operation of the Wi-Fi system. All right, the guard intervals, again, I'll show you a picture, and, the, and I mentioned the 1024 QAM. Okay, so the channel widths are the same, all right, for, for 11AC 11 and 11AX. <coughs> In this picture, I'm, they're both showing you 80 megahertz wide, but on the top, you notice that we were using an FFT size of 256. On the bottom, it's 1024, all right? So that's four times as many tones stuffed into the same space. There's uh, still have the guard tones to create space between the channels. You'll actually see that there's a few more in the middle that are turned off, um, and then there's there's and there's a chunk at each end that again to create the physical space between the channels. And we had to widen the, the definition in the middle. Now, why did we do that? Let me let me jump ahead here. This is why we, we did that. If you had a, a two megahertz chunk of eight or two eleven AC. There'd only be six of the six of the subtones in there. With 11AX, we actually get 26 sub subcarriers in there. So why is that important? Well, with 11AX, in the the RU26, the two megahertz block, two of the tones have to be allocated as pilot tones. If I was running this with 11AC and I only had six, and two of them were pilot tones, that's pretty inefficient use of the channel. Right, so this is one of the biggest reasons why they changed the the, the symbol the symbol duration or the, the symbol frequency from three twelve point five to seventy eight kilohertz was to squeeze more tones into this space. So this is what the RU twenty six looks like. There's physically twenty six tones, two of them are pilots, and in the case of an RU fifty two, it just means there's fifty two tones. In that case, four of them are pilots, and that roughly corresponds to two megahertz and four megahertz wide channels. Um, this is the impact of of the uh, going to the small to the longer duration packets. It does give a it means that it takes a lot longer to transmit the symbol. But the guard intervals, which are shown here, roughly to scale, the percentage of the time that you're you're transmitting the the cyclic redundancy is less. So the overhead associated with that has been reduced. So this is a marginal improvement in system efficiency. By again by going to to the to the tighter tones. Okay, so now let's jump back to this picture. So this is the this is really what this is the, the key feature of 11AX is OFDMA. You now have the ability to send any combination of non-overlapping blocks in that picture to any num to any number of users up to the maximum for the channel. So I could have a bunch of users with a two megahertz allocation. Then I could have a, another bunch of users with a four megahertz allocation. Maybe I give somebody else the uh, half of the channel. And that can happen on one burst, and on the next burst it can be completely different. I now have the opportunity to make quality of service physically manifest at the, at the physical layer. With wireless multimedia, with Wi-Fi, that was a statistical result. With wireless multimedia, they bias the, the for a high priority client, it would be, uh, it would have a higher probability of uh, seizing the channel. With this now, I can actually say, well, this user, this is a high priority user, I can assign this, this frequency block to that user, 
and that user will get it for as long as I need that user to have it, and it's deterministic, right? I can now say, this user's gonna get four megahertz, maybe it's, maybe it's the CEO of the company you're working for, and that, that allocation could potentially follow them through the network, so you could actually have a deterministic quality of service over the air. You can also manipulate how long a user gets that channel for, you can also determine how often the, the burst is sent to a user. So if you need, if a user or an IoT device needs to transmission every 10 milliseconds, you now have the opportunity to do that. So there, there's lots of degrees of freedom introduced with this. Uh, and I'm also gonna show you a little bit later on what the, the impact is on, on basic latency and jitter for, for a Wi-Fi system based on 11AX. Okay, does this, does this make sense? Because this is really the key aspect of 11AX. Yes, um, so the access point, so yeah, that's actually a really good question. The access point in 11AX, um, the question was, is this managed by the access point? So the answer to that question is yes. 11AX is interesting because it actually puts the access point much more firmly in control than it used to be. The, the access point is now allocating the channel width or the, the amount of spectrum the user is getting when the user will get on the air. Um, there's a magic piece of code that runs in every, every AP called the scheduler. There's a vanilla scheduler ship with the, with the, with the, um, the chipset, but each individual vendor, this is gonna be an area for wild potentially wild differentiation. You can completely alter the behavior of your radio between one vendor and the next because the scheduler is not standardized. And so it's open to all kinds of algorithmic fooling around. For IoT devices and industrial settings, you could make it so that every single device gets a two megahertz slot and they get it on a fixed schedule, right? Or if you're talking about a business environment, you could then have it left, op left wide open and it will just allocate the bandwidth on an on-demand basis. Or in fact, you can subdivide the channel. Part of it would be scheduled, part of it would be on-demand. So there's, there's a huge amount of work that I think you're gonna see the industry go through over the next probably three or four years as they take some of these really interesting algorithmic concepts and apply them to the radios. So, so great question, and there's more, more to come on that. Sorry? So, so it's, the 11AX is much more scheduled. The clients will still probe and still indicate that they have packets to send and that they will be then put into the queue, but the way that the queue is managed now is gonna be a lot more structured, right? Before it was just simply a bunch of, you, you, whoever won the battle would get the channel. Now the AP is gonna be determining on a burst by burst basis up to 37 users, which users are gonna be getting the channel. So it can now make much more intelligent decisions about how bandwidth is allocated. So the question was what happens with previous generations? When you're running against an 11AC client or an 11N client, the radio just falls back to, to compatibility mode, right? So, so if, there's, if you've got a group of users, maybe you've got 50 devices on your system, 12 of them are, are 11AX, the rest of them are legacy. So when it gets an opportunity, it will do a group burst to the 11AX devices, and then it will fall back and do an 11AC burst, an 11N burst, and then do another 11AX burst, right? So. Yeah, it still, it still negotiates that the same way it did before, right? So, so this is you know this is the hard part of actually writing a backwards compatibility standard that still runs 11B radios, right? The, the, the industry has to do this because scan guns and and that type of thing that you get used in industrial settings, most of those things are 12 to 15 years old. So, all right. So let me continue. This is an example of two sequential bursts. And the first one, uh, the, the, the red block that you see there, that's one user getting half of the channel. Then there's a few users getting two megahertz blocks and, and two others getting big chunks. And then on the next burst, that, that, that half channel allocation can be now divided up across a dozen users, right? The system has complete flexibility on a burst by burst basis to figure out how much bandwidth to allocate and to which user. So this is the other impact. Um, so if, assuming that somebody doesn't need the entire channel width, most of the time, as I showed you, that's not gonna be the case. And this is roughly to scale. This is showing three users with data to send. So if this was a legacy system, on the top you have 11AC, there would be a transmit and a reception, a transmit and a reception. Um, three different users would go through this process. 
With OFDMA, we can now send to all three of those users at exactly the same time. So it means the amount of time I'm using the air has actually been reduced by, by 50% in this example. That has massive implications, right? Because that means that not only did I clear the channel for the radio I'm operating on, I've now cleared the channel for every other radio on the same channel in the area, right? So it creates a lot of transmit opportunities for other devices. All right, so data rates. So where do the magic data rates come from? This, this calculation can be done for basically any digital radio system. You need to understand your symbol rate, which is 78.125 kilosymbols per second. That gives you your basic duration, which is one over that number. The cyclic extension, which I mentioned, it makes the system multipath tolerant, has to be accounted for when you're doing the calculation. And then you need to understand the modulation depth, right? So this is where the, we go from BPSK to up to 1024 qualm. <coughs> uh, 1024 qualm is 10 bits per symbol, or 10 bits per tone, and uh, BPSK is one bit per tone. And so depending how, whether you're close to the AP or for, farther away, you'll get a different modulation rate. So this is just a, a refresher. BPSK is literally, it's a one or a zero. You're given the top dot or the bottom dot. We only ever send one dot on any given tone at any given time, right? We don't send both of those at the same time because the radio will not to do with that. So if it's a one, the top dot goes. If it's a zero, the bottom dot goes. Now we can also do this in two dimensions, right? This is an IQ radio. So we can do it, uh, you can have a, a one zero left and right or a one zero up and down. And so the upper right hand quadrant here now is a one one. The bottom right hand corner, the bottom left hand corner is a zero zero. And that's how we're encoding the data because we don't send ones and zeros over the air, we send analog signals. So we encode the data with amplitude and phase information and then the receiver can figure out what, what the, the transmitter was sending. This continues for uh, what are called qualm rates, so it's quadrature amplitude, so it's amplitude and phase. So we have 16 qualm, 64 qualm, 256 qualm, and 1024 qualm. Now again, remembering that we're only sending one of those points at any given time, but um, one of the things that's interesting about looking at the plots this way, there's actually physical information encoded in these pictures. You'll note that the dots on the 1024 picture are about half the distance apart that they are in the, six, in the, uh, the 256 qualm picture. And that actually has physical meaning. That's a voltage. That's a difference in voltage. If you cut the voltage in half, you need 60 dB more signal to noise ratio in order to be able to properly decode that point. So this is why when you want to run really high data rates, you need to be a, a progressively closer to, to the device because you have to have enough signal to noise ratio to properly interpret the right, the right point. Because if, for example, if, if I'm on this plot, if I want to send this, but I have too much noise, the receiver may actually think that I'm sending this point or sending this point. In which case there's a bit error, the forward error correction may correct it, but I may have a packet failure as a result. So this is why we need more signal to noise ratio. I'm not gonna say that, that 11AX requires you to hold your phone up against the access point, but you're gonna have to be a little bit closer. Okay, uh, on the bottom right-hand corner is just this, uh, an actual measurement, uh, just a video captured off a of vector network analyzer. This is thousands of transmissions all, all shown on the screen. We're only sending one point at a time, but you end up with, this is what you see on a VSA or a vector spectrum analyzer. It actually shows up as the individual dots. You've, if you send random data, you eventually fill up all the squares on the picture. Make sense? Okay, don't see anybody laying on the floor railing yet, we're good. All right, now, so we have all that information. So in RU26, we've covered this, there's 26 tones. Two of them are pilots, so that's not sending useful data. So I have 24 left over. The raw data rate is, is 78 kilosymbols per second. And I know that with 1024 qualm, I'm sending 10 bits per tone. That gives me a raw rate for two megahertz block of 18 and three quarters megabits per second. Right? So even though it's only two megahertz wide, there's actually still lots of bandwidth associated with that. And this goes all the way up to the full channel. 996 is actually the 80 megahertz channel all being allocated to one user. And in that situation, there's 980 useful tones and that gives me a data rate, the raw rate of 760, uh, 760 megabits per second. Now this is per stream. Most major phone devices that are gonna be deployed with 11X are gonna be two stream devices. That means if you're running 80 megahertz channels, there's a very good chance that your system will be routinely exceeding a gigabit per second. 
If you had asked me that question with 11AC, I would have told you that in special lab conditions, if you can you contrive the test exactly right, you could get over a gigabit per second when you have two radios. With 11AX, it's actually pretty easy to do. So this is, this is one of the things that's going to be different. We're actually going to see true gigabit per second rates. And remember, the reason that that's going to be happening more often as well is I'm no longer sending 256 bytes over an 80 megahertz channel. I can now fill up the entire channel statistically far more often than I was able to do with 11N or 11AC. Because now I'm putting many more users and, and sharing that channel more effectively. So if you run the calculation, you get the raw rate in the left-hand side. Then we have the coding. So uh, MCS, for those of you that are familiar with that term, MCS means modulation and coding scheme. So you have your modulation, which gives you your raw rate, then coding. So if it's a half rate code, that means for every one bit of information we're putting on the air, we're at, we want to send, we're actually putting two on the air. For a 5-6 code, if we want to send five bits, we actually put six on the air. That's about 20% redundancy. Uh, that helps the receiver use that redundancy to help it do the forward error correction that I mentioned. Right? So it makes sense, right? MCS0 is the, is the rate that reaches the furthest. You want that to be most robust, so we have 50% redundancy in that situation. And MCS11, you're going to be very close to the access point. You don't need as much redundancy, and that's why we use a 5-6 code. So you take the raw rate, you multiply it by the coding, and you get the MCS rate, which is here, and then you have to include the guard interval. So this is the amount of time where we've taken a chunk of the packet and repeated it. And that guard interval then gives us the net data rates, remembering that these are per stream. On a two megahertz block, I'm able to do up to 15 megabits per second um, on a two megahertz block, and I can do that on an 80 megahertz channel to 37 users. Right now, contemplate a couple of things. First of all, if you're sending most data, you're probably not going to exhaust that amount of bandwidth, because that's actually about 30 megabits per second. Even if you're sending 4K video to your phone, on a phone form factor, the typical data rate over the air to a phone is around four megabits per second, right? So that means that potentially you could be supporting 37 video streams to 37 individual phones with, with zero contention. Every single time you want to transmit, the radio is always going to be available. You could not do that with 11AC because all those packets would have had to have been stacked up, right? So this is a really, really important change to the, to the standard. You can do that same calculation, you can extend this. And by the way, um, in most practical enterprise deployments, MCS5 is your typical, uh, your typical edge of cell. So you're still getting useful rates there, sort of in the seven to eight megabits per second range um, for a single stream, so that's about 15 megabits per second for dual stream device, all the way up to um, around 300 megabits per second per stream for a uh, for dual, dual stream device, sorry, for a single stream, so almost 600 megabits per second for a dual stream device at the edge of coverage. Right? Yep. 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 No. This is, this is, they fully generalize that, right? So if you've got a user that's far away, he's going to get his burst at MCS zero. Another user that's close in is going to get his burst at MCS8. And now we actually, so across that channel, you're going to have different modulation rates running across the width of the channel. There's some implications with that, which I'm going to cover a little bit later on. It also means that um, the AP now is also, also going to be determining the transmit power that's allowed for the client devices as well. But yeah, it allows for full mix. Each individual link is effectively separate from a radio perspective. Great question. Did, but just the question there, by the way, was uh, slot by slot across the OFDMA, uh, can I have different modulation rates on each one of those blocks? The answer is absolutely yes. Okay. So, OFDMA. So, how many of you are familiar with something called Erlangs? Probably date, date yourself. Okay. Erlangs are, 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 there's a guy named Erlang, literally. Um, he worked out the math a long time ago for queuing theory. For one of the applications of Erlang's is actually looking at call centers and figuring out how many people they need to have in a call center answering the phones. So basic queuing theory, it tells you the efficiency of the way that your resources are allocated. 
So you can use that, that calculation. It's not entirely precise, but it'll give you some insight in what's happening with 11AX. So one of the things that we saw with 11AC was this idea of having two 40 megahertz channels on a single, a single access point. So that was kind of an interesting idea. You had two bearers and it was kind of sticky because you couldn't easily move clients between them, but we're gonna take that as one of the cases. So you could have one user on 11AC and 80 megahertz or potentially two users on 11AC and 40 megahertz or with 11AX in that 80 megahertz block you can now have 37 users running an RU26. The data rates are quite different. The 11AC channel was capable of 338 megabits per second per stream. The, um, sorry, the, this, this would have been a dual stream device. Uh, a, a dual would have been uh, running uh, 156 megabits per second per user and the 11AX can give you 10.3 megabits per second per user at the edge of coverage. If we assume a standard transaction of about 125 kilobytes or one megabit, um, we can use Erlang's to, to, to calculate the impact of that. So let me put that to you visually. So imagine you're buying groceries and the grocery store has got to make a decision about how to invest their money in cashiers. They can go out and buy the coolest, fastest thing that they can find but it can only handle one user at a time. So it's all queued up, right? So all of the, so you can do, with that, with that really, really cool system you can do 100 transactions per minute and you can handle people's grocery carts and move them through. Or you can have two really superb cashiers that are capable of, of operating at 50 transactions per minute. Or you can hire some really dumb people that can barely operate a calculator that can handle three transactions a minute. Which is the best system? Right? It turns out it's the one on the right hand side. And the reason is, is especially if you're delay sensitive, right? If you're not talking about the absolute maximum data rate, if what you want to do is deal with traffic from a whole bunch of different sources, this is what happens when you do the analysis, right? So it takes roughly, um, roughly 30 times longer to send that burst through on the MCS5 with, with 11AX than it does for 11AC. The difference is, is I now have multiple ways of pushing that, that data through. Now, when you look at the way data shows up in your system, there's a pretty good chance that two or more people are gonna to wanna to transmit at the same time. And if you've got one super duper system that can only handle one transaction at a time, automatically they're getting queued up. If you've got two, it's better. So this is showing you over the course of an hour, how many one megabit per second bursts can I handle over the course of an hour. So it turns out uh, I can do 25,000 with 10 microseconds of delay. If I have two 40 megahertz channels, I can do 115,000 with 10 microseconds delay. Or if I've got 37 blocks, I can, tra I can handle 935,000 one megabit bursts with 10 microseconds delay. So this is telling you statistically that your delay and jitter is dramatically reduced with this system. Even though the peak data rate per user is less, it's the fact that I've got multiple channels to push them through. And this isn't being pessimistic because this is assuming that I've got a fixed width. If I've got channel space left over, if I've got unused RUs, I can actually allocate some users more bandwidth uh, opportunistically and actually do better than this, right? So this is, a, this is a huge impact. It means that you can rely on, on Wi-Fi in many circumstances like industry where you're doing you're doing production line type stuff with, with, you know, with things whipping by at a very high rate, you can now have low, very low latency, deterministic latency with, with 11AX where you couldn't do that with uh, 11AC or 11M. So this is really a huge, huge change um, in, in the way that we need to think about Wi-Fi. All right, BSS color. So BSS coloring, again, I mentioned this earlier, this is the idea that CSMA has not served us well, but it, it's a little too restrictive, particularly if you're in a, in a complex environment. So obviously in an enterprise environment or a stadium, you've got lots and lots of access points, but one of the places that people don't think about is um, you, this also applies in an apartment building. For, for those of you that are in an apartment, I have a small apartment in Santa Clara. Um, I can see about 40 different SSIDs on my channel, and that means that we're all sharing the channel. So fortunately it kind of works but it doesn't work as efficiently as it might. With BSS coloring, I now have the, op the, the, the radios can make more intelligent decisions about when to respect CSMA and when to ignore it. So this was the problem before, right? So 11, 11N, 11AC, 11A, 11G, 
Um, as, as soon as you heard something above the, the CSMA threshold, you just stopped transmitting. And it didn't matter whether it was coming from your particular area or from the adjacent areas. With 11AX, um, there's a small number of bits allocated. If the color does not match, I now use a different threshold. So in other words, if I'm on channel number one and I'm on the green, the green cell here up in the, up in the right hand corner, that's got a different color code than when I'm on the gray one in the middle. That means that I, it, since I know that this isn't coming from my immediate area, I can now use a modified threshold and selectively ignore that guy. Which means I get many more transmit opportunities in a dense environment, which reduces latency, which reduces jitter and gives you better system performance. Because if I get two or three users that are able to transmit at the same time, they're on the air, then they're off the air, that clears the channel much more quickly. Almost everything that we do in digital communications, whether it be Wi-Fi or any other standard, it's all about scavenging airtime. And this is a great way to scavenge airtime. If you can get that airtime back by doing multiple transmissions at the same time, that's a really good thing. And this does not require synchron any synchronization through the network. We don't have to do anything unusual. It, it's just simply um, by more intelligently applying the algorithm, you get a better result. So this is the basic state machine. Um, with CSMA, you would go down and you would say, okay, well, ignoring the color, I would just say, okay, well, I see, I see above threshold. I say the channel is busy and I have, to, I have to sit and wait. If it comes down, if the colors match, they still do the same thing. But if the color is different, I now say, okay, well, it's below the modified threshold, so I can go ahead and transmit, which means I now have an opportunity to, to go ahead. So this is the, the, the busy work. Let me show you the actual sort of measurement numbers. Um, these are the numbers that are taken from the standard. Minus 82 dBm is the level that, that a radio today by standard will, will stop transmitting. But when you think about it, in, in, in most enterprise settings, most of the access points are transmitting around 18 or 19 dBm. So this is the uh, access point on the right hand side. I'm now allowed to ignore a packet that comes in um, below minus 76. That 6 dB difference is a factor of two in range, right? So that means that I'm now ignoring 50% of the distance that I can hear, right? That's a big change. So that gives me many more opportunities. And on the client side, most clients are around 25, 25 milliwatts or 14 dBm. So the clients are about six or seven dB better as well. And that means the clients now are going to have an opportunity to transmit much more aggressively, right? So both ends are improved by virtue of this standard. Um, and it's a simple, it's a very simple algorithm. You, you simply look at the transmit power you're, that you're intending to send, and that tells you the level of power that you can ignore. Because the reason it's dependent on your transmit power is because if you're a high transmit power device and you send, it's a good chance you'll interfere further away. But if you're sending lower power, you're going to interfere further away, or less, for, less far away, and you're going to receive interference less far away. So that's why it's based on power, but this is a really important um, innovation in the standard. It's a fairly subtle idea, but it, it's, a, it's a useful one. Okay, so we touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, this, it's been interesting in the, in, the, in the cellular side of the business, power control of the client device has been with us from like day one. GSM used to do this. In the Wi-Fi industry, Companies like Apple and Samsung have been resisting any attempts in the past to try to put transmit power control into client devices. 11AX does not work if you don't have some level of power control for the client devices. The red one here is showing you what would happen if you've got a client that's very close to the access point and broadcasting at maximum power. It's gonna have spectral gunk outside of the channel and it will actually block the, the transmissions from another user that's trying to come in at the same time. So the AP now, in, as, in addition to assigning how much spectrum and when to transmit and how much bandwidth, uh, it also says what power level that the client's allowed to transmit at. That has an incremental benefit, by the way, for the client devices, because if you transmit lower power, you consume less current, and your battery lasts a little bit longer. So it's, it's actually kind of a good thing, but again, the, the, client got, the, the client device manufacturers have been resisting this for a long time. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is something called uh, transmit wait time. So sleep mode has been built into the Wi-Fi center for a long time. 
This is a pretty substantial improvement in the sleep mode capabilities. Um, devices can literally go to sleep for like a week at a time. The association will be maintained. And so you can have extremely low duty cycles that allows Wi-Fi to be looked at as an IoT technology because um, now you can have duty cycles which are, you know, 1% or 0.1% and the device can go to sleep for a long time and you can literally have a battery-powered IoT device that now is going to have, you know, an operational lifetime of, you know, maybe two, two years plus. So that gets into a practical range. Great question, I have no idea. So the question was about session timeouts. So the, the idea is that the association is maintained. In terms of what's happening at the higher level protocols, I have no idea because I'm a physical air guy. Okay, um, so, so this, is a, this is a much more effective mechanism introduced in the standard. It gives you significant power, power consumption uh, improvements and will be part, uh, definitely part of the standard. One of the other things that, that they had to think about with 11AX was when you had um, wearables like an Apple Watch or some, some other device like that, those devices were 20 megahertz only. In 11AC and 11N, it didn't matter. The radio would just adapt down because the client, it knew the client was only 20 megahertz wide. It would just go down to 20 megahertz, transmit to that client, and go back up to 80 megahertz again. With 11AX, that 20 megahertz device has to coexist with a 40 or 80 megahertz capable device. So this was part of the standard. This is important because uh, it, they didn't want to force wearables to, to be using um, the full channel width because when you double or quadruple your clock frequency, the power consumption is, is pre tracks pretty closely with the clock frequency in a device. So this allowed wearables and other devices like that to maintain their low power consumption profile, um, but still allow for the benefits of providing all 80 megahertz to all of the devices that can operate at the same time. So this is part of the standard. It's mandatory uh, for access points. It's optional for clients. Obviously, if you have an 80 megahertz capable device, you don't need to do this. Uh, but if you're building a 20 megahertz only device, it has to be compliant with this. All right, how are you guys doing? Sticking with me? Okay, cool. All right, multi-user MIMO. So for those of you that, were, that know about this, this was introduced in 11 AC. There are a couple of limitations with it. Um, the way that it was implemented on clients and, and, and the, there was a lot of overhead attached to it. In order for multi-user MIMO to work, which we'll actually go into depth in a, in a few minutes, in order for multi-user MIMO to work, there was actually packets sent over the air, they're called sounding packets. And so you, they're literally just a ping. It would go out to a client and the client would respond back and it would, there'd be another one. So if you had a whole bunch of clients, you'd be spending a lot of your time just sending the sounding packets over the air. That was a problem. Right? So it meant that really you couldn't get a benefit from multi-user MIMO once you got to pass sort of a dozen or, or maybe 15 devices. With 11AX, now we can do multi-user MIMO sounding to 37 users at the same time, and they can all respond back at the same time. So that just made multi-user MIMO almost two orders of magnitude more effective. Right? So multi-user MIMO with 11AX is going to be a real useful feature. We're seeing broad support in the client devices with the partners that we're working with and every chipset supports it from an access point perspective. Um, the, other, the other thing that, uh, about multi-user MIMO the, is the concept of also using it on the uplink. So, the, so with uplink multi-user MIMO, it was looked at for 11AC, but there was an issue of how to synchronize the transmissions, and I'll, I'll show you a picture in a minute. But the key when you're doing uplink multi-user MIMO is having all your users transmitting on the full channel width all at the same time. That needed synchronization, and that was addressed in uh, 11AX. So uplink multi-user MIMO kind of looks very similar to having one device with two antennas or two devices with one antenna each. <coughs> so the math for these two pictures is exactly the same as long as the two clients start transmitting at the same time. In the laptop, that was guaranteed because it's coming from one device. On the client side, we had, to, we had to build a new mechanism into the standard to allow for that, that synchronization of the client transmissions. And the way that was done was something called, with, with something called a trigger frame. The trigger frame is a new kind of utility packet that's built into the 11AX standard. It does sounding, it, does the, it tells the devices which, uh, what their channel allocation is going to be, whether it's going to be a, an OFDMA burst or a multi-user MIMO burst. 
Um, it does a lot of coordination, but it also gives you the synchronization pulse for all of the clients to start transmitting at the same time. So important packet, I don't know too much more about it beyond what I just described, but it's really the key to make uplink, uplink multi-user MIMO work. Now, why do we still look at multi-user MIMO? Because we got this really cool efficiency thing with OFTMA. Well, there'll still be some transmissions that are gonna need 1500 byte packets. You know, if you're sending a large email, if you're sending a PowerPoint deck, you know, it's gonna be driven by stuff like that. Large file transfers are gonna drive that. So, it would have been easy just to say, well, you know, we got OFTMA, so screw the, the, the uh, multi-user MIMO stuff because it's complicated. Well, until you do the math. So the small packets are shown, we have, so the, the, you can ignore the blue curve, that's single user, with, um, on the left hand side is maximum size packets, okay, and if we're sending 1500 byte packets, uh, multi-user MIMO, which is the red dots, is always better. So that means what, when we're talking about multi-user MIMO, you have multiple users that are sending on the full channel width, right, but now you're using antenna techniques to isolate those users. On the right hand side, it's showing you the similar calculation with uh, using OFDMA with small packets. And in this case, OFDMA is always more efficient, independent of the signal to noise ratio. So this is part of what the scheduler will have to do is figure out uh, do I use multi-user MIMO or do I use OFDMA on this burst, right? And it, it's showing you that both modes are, are very effective um, if the packet characteristics are right. And so this is why the, the, the AP is going to have to do a lot more heavy lifting with 11AX because it's going to have to look at the traffic characteristics, the size of the packets that need to be sent, um, and determining how to allocate the channel. So that's the, that's the simulation result. And on the uplink, it's the same thing. Uh, in the uplink, maximum size packets um, are, benefic are, are benefit from using MIMO. And on the download, uh, sorry, on, with small packets, you're always better off with, uh, with OFDMA. So this is why both modes are supported in 11AX. Now, that's the end of my 11AX discussion per se. We're gonna completely change gears on here and talk about uh, antennas and the way that signal processing and antennas come together in, in digital signal process uh, with digital digital communications to give you benefits. All right, the most basic antenna that you can build is a piece of wire, and you run an electron up and down it, and that causes radiation away from the middle. That is the simplest antenna that you can conceive of. So you get an omnidirectional pattern; everything goes around, goes away, kind of ripples in a pond when you drop a pebble into it. If you put two of those antennas side by side and you separate them by a half wavelength and now both of them are moving up and down at the same time, that creates, uh, this is the most basic phased array antenna that you can build. And in this situation, the, because it's a half wavelength, when it propagates left to right, they're 180 degrees out of phase, they cancel going left and right, and they reinforce going up and down. So that results in the antenna pattern that you see on the right hand side, okay? Now, there's a point to this, I'm not, I'm, I, so you just have to stick with me. All right, you can extend that. You can go to four elements. The antenna becomes more directive. You can see now that the width of this, this section here at the top is much narrower. Um, you get some side lobes. Side lobes are not mistakes, by the way. They're just, they come out of the math. Um, side lobes and antennas are a natural result of, of maximizing the antenna gain. Okay, again, all it is is just the waves from each one of the antennas adding up in a particular direction. They're all half wavelength apart, so again, you get cancellation to the left and right. But maybe I don't like the side lobes. So is there a way to get rid of the side lobes? Well, it turns out there is. You can build something called a binomial antenna. Instead of being one, 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 so even amplitude, the two middle ones can be excited at three times the signal strength, and I can actually get rid of the side lobes uh, as a result of doing that. Now, the trade-off is, is that I have lower antenna gain because the main beam is a lot fatter, right? So, so that, but that's a benefit. If you don't want the side lobes, and for example, if you're building an antenna for uh, a stadium where you're coming from the top, you don't want the side lobes lighting up the end zones, right? So, so this would be an example of how you would shape an antenna uh, for a particular application. Or maybe you don't want the main, the peak of the beam to go straight away from the antennas. You want it to be tilted off to one side. And in that situation, we can do phase-only synthesis for the antenna array. Uh, in this case, the one on the right-hand side, yeah, the one on the right-hand side starts first. 
then the second one, then the third one, then the fourth one. And so this creates a phase slope and the antenna tilts away from the phase slope. So this is showing you how you can manipulate amplitude and phase and you can change the antenna pattern. Everybody got that? Good, because now we're gonna do the hard part. So the most important concept in digital communications is orthogonality. OFDMA is orthogonal frequency division multiple access. You could also have orthogonal antenna patterns. And what do I mean by that? And there are two, uh, two mathematical functions are orthogonal if one, of them, if one of them is a peak at one location where the other one is a zero. In OFDMA, the individual tones, they're a peak and all the other tones are zero underneath in the middle of that tone. In antennas, this is the same idea. The blue curve is what we got earlier where I had two elements and they were excited in phase. They were both going up and down at the same time. This brown curve is what happens if now, I, instead of putting the two antennas in phase, I put them 180 degrees out of phase. So this is kind of the sum difference uh, stuff that was shown on the earlier session. In that case, I have, a, I have my peaks go out to the side. <coughs> but you'll note here that I have a peak on this function and a zero on the brown one. That literally means that I can put one user at the top of this picture and one user on the right hand side and I can send them two completely independent data streams because the antennas isolate the two users. That antenna subsystem is orthogonal if you excite it that way. Okay, that's a really, really powerful concept. This is another example. Now with three antenna elements, instead of just having, now I have three different colors. I can have one user here, one user here, and one user on the right hand side. And again, now I can send three streams of independent information. So this is, this is the simplest form of MIMO. Okay, in fact, you know, there were systems that were built like this in the analog days. It's really hard to do, um, but it is possible to do this from an analog perspective. You can extend this four elements, you can go up to eight elements, you can go to any number of elements you want. But there's a problem with this. This only works in spaces where you have no reflections, right? You're literally between the earth and the moon. In this room, when I go off in that direction, I have some of my energy bouncing off the wall and it comes back. That causes contamination, right? So this black curve, instead of being nicely nulled out here, I've actually got energy that's gone off the wall and come back here now causing interference, right? So I have to do something extra, right? I have to get the digital signal processing to orthogonalize my antenna system for the propagation channel, for the room that I'm operating in. And that, by the way, is the basis for transmit beamforming, for MIMO, for multi-user MIMO, all of that stuff is based on this idea of orthogonality. The system does basic algebra and it orthogonalizes the channel. So let me show you what that means. Okay, so. Some of you have probably seen pictures like this before. Um, this is actually from a simulator that I built with, of a room with no wall, with, with no windows and no doors. Um, but the idea here is that I've got three antennas on my, my access point and three antennas on the client. All right, so the, the three different colors that you see there are related to um, the three antennas that are on the access point. And you can see, even though in this case, the antennas are probably about, are, are about this far apart, but you get vastly different signal characteristics where the antennas are on the client. I can take advantage of that and orthogonalize the channel, right? I actually want nice strong reflections and that's how, that's how all of this stuff works. So MIMO processing, if you're running, you're talking about an eight by eight access point or a four by four access point, it is leveraging all of the reflections in the space and it has to do it frequently because when you move or the, or the door opens and closes, it's gonna change the characteristic of the channel, so it has to constantly be computing this, this matrix. But this matrix, by the way, um, all this is really, if I have three antennas on my access point, the, this, all this is is the measurements that I took at the client. So during the sounding process, I'm sending known information over the air, so the client knows what to expect, and, if, and it can actually calculate what the channel did between the AP and the client antennas, and then work out what that matrix is. So this, the matrix is nothing more than a measurement because being a lazy engineer, I actually went digging a number of years ago hoping that somebody else had done a simple, simplified example of this and of course the answer was no. Most of the time you see this matrix on the top of the paper and then it gets really scary, they do really scary statistics. This is a physical model where I'm actually showing you how this stuff works. So this matrix on the, uh, this H matrix as it's called or the channel matrix is simply measurements of the space. Now, if the client can measure that, 
and then send it back to the AP to tell the AP, this is how I hear the three antennas on the access point. I can do pre-processing at the access point to actually separate the signals out at the client. That's a really powerful idea, but that's why you do sounding on downlink multi-user MIMO. We actually send, send a sounding packet out. The client say, okay, hey, this is how here are the three antennas. It sends it back to the AP. The AP inverts the matrix, multiplies by what it would have sent, and this is now the beam form system, the beam forming system that it sends over the air. So the antennas are actually sending three different symbols over all of the antennas on the access point. Right, that's kind of bends people's brains a little bit. By, by using the algebra, you can actually see by multiplying this out that the, sim, the, the stream one, stream two, and stream three are now getting mushed up across the three antennas on the access point. Okay? So that's an important idea to understand that all three antennas are involved in the process in this case. If it's a four by four, it's all four antennas. If it's an eight by eight, all eight antennas. Now, what does this look like in practice? All right, so here's this very, very simple example between the Earth and the Moon. I have a three antenna AP and a single antenna client. Okay, so what do you expect the antenna patterns would look like? I don't know, probably a, a simple beam pointing at the client. Well, if you do the math, that's exactly what you get. It's slightly tilted to the right because the client is slightly tilted to the right. Right? Every, every, that makes sense to everybody? Okay, now, as we know, we don't live between the Earth and the Moon. We live in physical spaces. So let's put one wall on each side and only look at the first reflection in the environment. So if I put one wall on each side, there's the, the AP and the client. They're still exactly the same relative position, except now I have bounces that go off the left wall, off the right wall, and up the middle. What do you think the antenna pattern looks like now? Well, it looks like this. It's not very pretty, and if you actually plot it on, you can actually see the peak of the antenna pattern is actually not lined up with the client. And why is that? Well, it, the system is actually taking some of the energy and putting it on this bounce, some of the energy and putting it on this bounce, and then it's doing its best to get the, the, main, the main beam lined up. This, is the, this, this pattern maximizes, in a transmit beam forming sense, maximizes the signal not in the general area of the user, not in the general area of the phone, literally on the antenna inside of the phone, right? So it, it's actually peaking up the signal strength directly up on top of the antenna by using the bounces and the direct path to actually give you an optimum result. But there's no way, this is not a pretty antenna pattern, right? This is not the, this is, this is what some people would have you believe is going on with beam farming. That's not what's going on. Beam farming is a terrible name for this. It's actually channel optimization. Okay, now, what happens if I do the same thing, but now I've got three antennas on the clients? I end up with three antenna patterns that are transmitted at the same time, one for each stream, and this actually peaks up the individual signals on each of the antennas at the client. In this space, those three antenna patterns that you see are orthogonal. Similar to what I showed you before, but now I'm actually accounting for the reflections in the space. So this is what, if I go back to my original plot and I look at what the signals look like directly underneath the antennas on the client, this doesn't look like much, but fortunately this is algebra and this is all, these are copies of the same signal, so they add up algebraically. This is actually what happens when you combine them Stream three shows up only under antenna three on the client. Stream one and stream two are actually nulled out. It's a pretty cool result, right? Like, you wouldn't expect that to happen looking at this picture, but that's actually what happens. It also means that if you're trying to listen to a multi-user MIMO burst, good luck. Because the signals over here are completely mashed and you can't, dif you can't differentiate them from one another. Unless you have a multi-antenna access point. You, if you want to listen to, a, to an 8x8 access point sending to 8 clients, you have to have an 8-antenna eight, a, a eight probe. Stream 1 and Stream 2. Stream 1 shows up underneath antenna 1. Stream 2 shows up underneath antenna 2, and it's nulled out under the other, other two. So let's take a small jump here. Imagine that instead of those three antennas being attached to one device, those three antennas are now attached to three devices. That's multi-user MIMO. That's exactly how it works. The system does the heavy lifting at the access point to physically separate the signals at the clients. So that the client can't, if there's only got one antenna, it can't do anything. It can't do any processing to try to get rid of the, the superfluous information. 
So let's look at that in practice. Matrix is the same. The only difference here is now is that, that on the right hand side, those are three different users with one antenna each. And they can only send back one row of the matrix. They can't send back the entire matrix because they only have one antenna. So what happens is the AP, when it's ready to make a transmission, it actually grabs a group of three or a group of eight or whatever the number is, puts them together, inverts the, inverts the matrix, and then transmits to all of the clients that it's targeting. It's pretty much the same process, it's just the sounding, the sounding process is different. But the underlying math is identical. So now if I do my sounding, my client antennas here are further apart. By the way, I've shown these on a line just because it makes better graphs. <laughs> um, this is fully generalized. It doesn't matter where the clients are. I've just put them in a line because it makes it easier for me to represent. So when, when I'm sending out my sounding, it's all done Omni. By the way, one of the rules for multi-user MIMO for transmit beam forming, the antenna patterns need to generally match. They need to light up as many reflection paths as possible. If you use a directional antenna, it actually reduces the effectiveness of the system. You want, the, you want to use simple omnis, particularly for indoor applications, if you can. So this is the sounding process. In this case, there's four antennas, so there's four colors underneath. It's all mashed up. But remember, each one of the clients is going to make a measurement now for the four antennas and send it back to the, to the AP, and then I get the same result. Now we get this really funky looking pattern off the axis point. Um, not very pretty, but it's orthogonal in this space. It gives me a peak under client one and a null under client two and client three. Right? So we've orthogonalized the channel. I now enabled multi-user MIMO. I have one client operating that way, and the same thing happens for the other two clients as well, and you get different antenna patterns for the space. Everybody's brain hurt now? Go. Cool. So, Last topic, and it looks like I'm not going to come anywhere near the time I expected, but it is what it is. Um, so one of the things that I've, I've been wanting to do for a long time is, is sort of visually represent a space and understand how MIMO is different from one point to the next. So every one of you has ex probably experienced, you take a speed test and you're standing right here and you move over six inches and you get a completely different result. Right? Why is that? Well. The images I showed you earlier with all the signal variations can kind of give you an idea. But it turns out there's actually a lot of information in that matrix. So first of all, we'll talk about what the tool's doing. It's taking a, a rectangular box with no windows and no doors. Um, it puts the AP about four inches below the ceiling, which is fairly common for, for most indoor access points. I'm using, for most of the simulations, I'm using simple omnis. I'm assuming that the antenna is a ball. Um, and then the client is moved every, every 10 centimeters, every four inches back and forth across the space and it builds up the matrix that you're gonna look at. All right, so first thing I thought would be interesting would be, well, okay, how does the actual antenna placement on the access point affect it? If you're building an, uh, an AP with four antennas, you can put them in a square, which is the most common thing because it makes the AP kind of square and as small as possible. Or you could put all four of them in a line, right? Which would make the AP really wide but maybe that works better. Well, so this is what I did. Uh, I, the, the red dot here indicates the AP position. And so this is showing you with the four antennas on the access point lined up um, in, in a line. And I've got a two, two antenna client device. So in these pictures, purple is perfect. And as, for, uh, as you go up this, this graph, when it gets up to red, if you've got a point that's red, the, the MIMO doesn't work. It breaks. There isn't enough there isn't enough information or enough degrees of freedom in the channel in order for the system to, to separate the two streams. So you can see kind of on this plot, there's, you probably can't see it from the back of the room, but on this plot on the right hand side, there's one little dot there that's red. So at that point in space, you probably can't run MIMO or it will operate at a really low data rate. But in general, it works pretty good over the space and it's fairly independent. The, the two curves on the bottom here, they're obscured a little bit. That's actually showing you the distribution of the points. So most of them are over to the left-hand side. System's gonna work pretty well. All right, now let's look at it if I put the antennas on the axis point in a square. It hasn't changed much, and the distribution's roughly the same. So that tells me that I'm pretty safe putting four antennas in a square, or putting four antennas in a line, and I can, as long as they're, they need to be at least a half wavelength apart, but other than that, I've got pretty, it's pretty comfortable we can move the antennas around inside the, the chassis. 
That was kind of an interesting result. I've asked that question for years and I never had a good way of representing it, now I do. All right, now I did look at a case, I can actually build real antenna patterns into the system, so assuming, instead of assuming it's just radiating like a ball, I put the antenna pattern on the right hand side, so that's, it's rotationally symmetric. I put that antenna pattern in um, and then looked at the difference between an isotropic and a real antenna. There's some differences in the overall shape. The, the high points are a little di slightly different places, but the overall distribution is roughly the same. So I can still use an, an isotropic antenna when I'm doing the simulations and get useful insights out of the results. All right, now this is really the interesting one because this was a question that my customers have been asking me for years. Why would I buy a four by four access point if I've only got two antennas on my client? Right, this is the most common question in Wi-Fi. And here's actually the answer. This is the picture I showed you before with four antennas in a square. Exactly the same plot you saw before. Everything is nice and, you know, nice and dark and I kind of get maybe up to about a third of the way up this plot. Probably means the room's working pretty well. That's with four antennas. What happens if I go to two antennas? Well, it, this is what happens. Doesn't mean that the system's not working, but it's gonna be, there's gonna be far more places in the room where it's gonna struggle to support the higher modulation rate. Right, so we've actually done this test. We didn't do it with a four by four access point. We did a two by two access point. We ran dual stream and single stream data rates. And we actually replicated this experimentally as well as is in the simulation. So all of these points that you see here that are red or even you know, going above the scale here, those are locations where MIMO is gonna to struggle to operate. Or if it does operate, you're gonna be running at very low MCS rates on both radios, right? So the two, the two streams will be like at MCS2 instead of MCS9 in the blue areas. So this is the impact. Now, if you only got one or two users in the room, it probably doesn't matter, but if it's a meeting space, this, would be, this is a good reason to look at putting more antennas into that space. Even though the total, the total peak data rate is identical, the system, the user experience is gonna be quite different whether you have four antennas on the access point or two. So actually that, that, that is a truism, right? More is always better. Um, and for the number of antennas, that I will qualify. For the number of antennas, more is always better. But the benefit, it, it, it drops off, it's diminishing returns. Right, when you, go from, when you go from the same number of antennas to double the number of antennas, you'll get this much change. When you go from, if you double it again, you'll get this much change, right? So there's, there's a law of diminishing returns. So um, the, with 11AX, if you've got a high density environment, you're gonna put more antennas on, you're gonna look at, it at an eight by eight access point for like a lecture hall at a university, because you've got hundreds of students there that are beating on it with three to four devices each right, because they're watching their video while they're listening to the prof and they're recording it and uploading it to, 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 their, to their storage. Um, so it, it's gonna depend on your environment. Um, but from a, from a raw MIMO perspective, which is what this is looking at, to, uh, with a two by two client, you wanna have at least four antennas and then you'll get incremental benefits beyond that. Having more antennas for higher capacity environments is beneficial because it engages other features. Okay? So the, the question was, if, I, if, four, if four is better, is six better than that, and eight better than that? The answer is, if I go from two to four with two by two client, I get a big change. If I go from four by four to eight by eight, which I can eventually get around to simulating, um, the, the delta will be smaller. Because this plot is actually pretty good, right? So you can see the distribution on the bottom here. So that, I go from, the, from having a four by four to having two by two, you can see they get smeared out and there's more, much more of the distribution that's at the higher, the higher numbers. One of the other questions that I get very commonly is, I can't put something on the ceiling, either the architects are complaining or I've got asbestos in the ceiling, so can I, can I put the access point really high in the wall? How much difference does that make? So this is the, the, the simulation as well, literally looks at the corner and what's the difference between putting the AP on, in, in, on the vertical part of the corner or the horizontal part of the corner? And this is the answer. Um, a ceiling mount and a wall mount, except along the wall, like literally you're leaning against the wall and the access point's over there, uh, except along the wall, they're pretty much equivalent. Which is again, kind of an interesting result because I never had a way to actually discuss this with customers, right? 
Now, the one thing that would happen is in that situation, they have more energy going upstairs and downstairs that could cause more interference above and below. But from a single room perspective, the coverage characteristic and the MIMO support is going to be roughly the same, which is kind of a neat result. Now, this is the other case that, that I'm sure all of you have experienced. This is a fairly small room. It's pretty good everywhere. And you're sitting at your desk and you, and you make a measurement like this and then you turn your phone and you get a different answer. Well, why is that? Is that supported in the simulation? In this case, the, the phone is rotating and you can see how the distribution is changing. So if you're moving it in the XY plane in this relatively small room, it doesn't change much. So it's just spinning on the table. But all of you have had the experience of going from, from sort of landscape to portrait mode, right? So what happens when you do it vertically? That's what this one is. Uh, in this case, again, it, it's fairly stable, but you can actually see when it's vertical, you get areas, you get these bright spots in the room where it, it, it's different, right? And it, this lines up again, if you've ever done large scale experiments with Wi-Fi and you've got lots of client devices scattered around, you can get literally point variations in the room where all of a sudden like six inches over and you're like still in the middle of the room, it's different. And that's what this simulation is showing. Correct. It's identical to laptop open and close. Yeah, it's identical to that. And that is the end of my deck. So I went through it a little more quickly. I hope that was a useful, entertaining, and, and, uh, and a learning experience. Uh, I'll be around for a while. So if you guys got some questions, we can follow up. Thanks very much.